we've been on the board in um, uh, about, I want to say six or six years. Um, uh, welcome to our town hall tonight. Uh, just a reminder, as you probably just saw the announcement that this is being recorded and it will be available, the, the town hall will be available on our website in a few days. And um, I will, I thank you again for joining us and turn it over to Mason. Hey there, thanks so much, Maria. Uh, my name is Mason Jay. I'm a board member. I'm actually the baby of the board, the newest board member, but a long time uh, a historical society member. Um, and I'm here to offer the land acknowledgement. Uh, first of all, we just wanna thank you for joining us here today and start by you know, using the increasingly common practice of acknowledging traditional indigenous inhabitants of the land. However, instead of merely saying that we acknowledge the Ohlone and leaving it that, I'd actually prefer to inform our viewers that this town hall is being held uh, and broadcast on occupied Ohlone land, which was settled on by Spanish, Mexican, and American settlers through acts of forced labor, genocide, uh, coercion, and deceit. While these things are very hard to hear, it's actually important that we name them in acknowledging the land and in making this very brief but more accurate acknowledgement as an indigenous and black San Franciscan, I aim to honor the enduring relationship that exists between all indigenous peoples and our traditional territories. Let us not only remember that the Ohlone connection to this region uh, is here and all around us, but let's also give thanks for the opportunity to reside, to work, create, preserve, and organize on Ohlone land. Um, I'd like to close by encouraging any Native folks who are also joining us today uh, uh, to sound off in the chat as land acknowledgements do not exist in the past tense and colonialism is an ongoing atrocity that we continue to cultivate mindless or mindfulness around participating in. So I thank you for giving me this brief amount of time to just kind of name these things and to acknowledge the Native folks past, present and future who are doing this work on this land. Um, I'll give it back to Maria at this point. Thanks so much. We can't hear you, Maria. Um, thank you, Mason, for um, um, recognizing all that and saying it, you're right, it needs to be said out loud and, and we need to acknowledge it. Um, at this point, um, I would like to turn it over to uh, Kyle uh, to go over the agenda and the ground rules. Hello, thank you for joining us this evening. We're very excited to have you with us. Uh, my name is Kyle Levenger and I'm your board secretary. Um, our agenda tonight, we have some great uh, information to share out. Uh, we're going to start with um, highlighting major uh, new accomplishments and programs from 2020 and 2021. We'll then spend about five minutes uh, sharing an update on rebranding the organization, followed by a new museum funding update, and uh, followed by uh, board roles and recruitment. We are actively recruiting for board members. And then we'll have about 15 minutes uh, or so uh, for Q&A and open discussion. And we hope to wrap up by um, 6.30. Um, I'm going to hand it over now to Rigoberto to uh, go over uh, some of the ground rules. Hello, everyone. My name is Rigoberto Marquez. Uh, I've been on the board for a little over uh, three years. So just wanted to kind of talk about some of the Zoom functions. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you do see a CC and a live transcript option. We are transcribing this, um, this conversation. So feel free to use the CC button if you would like to see um, um, subtitles or for our conversation. Um, please use the chat um, button or the chat feature to submit any questions. Um, again, as Kyle mentioned, we will have time at the end for Q&A. And so those questions will be um, looked at towards the end. And for the Q&A portion that will be coming at the end, any questions that have been submitted in advance via email will be given um, priority. And now I'd like to hand it over to Mark. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my name is Mark Sawchuk. I am the communications manager here at the GLBT Historical Society, um, and I've been involved with the organization since 2016, so now I'm an oldie but goodie. 
on staff and um, I've been in my current role for three years and am uh, responsible for a lot of the day-to-day -day communications of the organization. So welcome to the to the um, discussion tonight. We do ask um, in fairness to all that um, when you're not speaking that you stay muted uh, and in case we have to host may mute speakers uh, who aren't speaking um, in turn. Uh, also, you can use the reactions buttons at the bottom of your Zoom window to interact with speakers um, and also to submit to raise your hand virtually um, for a question during the Q&A part of the uh, discussion. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to our um, director of archives, Kelsey Evans, and our um, museum uh, manager, Lee. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Kelsey Evans, she, her pronouns, and I am the Director of Archives and Special Collections. I'm also serving as co-interim executive director currently. Um, so I just want to touch on a few things that have sort of been happening at the Historical Society, um, especially in the archives, because that's uh, my love and passion. Uh, so we have a lot of archival upgrades have sort of been going on. We, with the support of the State Library um, and several uh, private donors as well, we have been able to implement a new digital asset management system, which is really exciting for us. It makes uh, so much of our digital preservation and access possible um, and much more sustainable in the long term. So this has been a, a huge project. It's still ongoing, but we are very excited about that. Um, we've we sort of had some vault upgrades to help with our preservation and storage. Um, we've been uh, installed new shelving again with the support of donors. So just thank you to everybody who continues to support the work. Um, this new shelving is helping to store and preserve our ever growing archives. Um, we are back on site and open to researchers in the reading room um, and open to donations again. So we've been able to sort of safely manage that um, throughout the ongoing pandemic. We've received some really great uh, new collections recently, including um, additions to the Lion Martin papers um, and the papers of Felicia Elizondo. Um, we have upgraded our online resources. If you hadn't, haven't, haven't had a, check, a chance to sort of check out the website in a while, I'd really encourage you to do that. Our online resources page is really uh, greatly expanded and upgraded. Uh, we have a lot of new resources, including primary source sets that are sort of arranged by topic. Um, and dozens of new digital collections that include really thousands of new resources that are all available remotely. Um, finally, we have some new initiatives sort of uh, happening right now. We're working to landmark and preserve the Lion Martin House um, in coordination with uh, several community groups. We brought home to San Francisco the only known piece of the original rainbow flags. Very excited about that. It's on display now in the museum, so definitely go check that out. Um, and in the archives, we're working on a National Archives uh, funded grant through their NHPRC program um, to process and digitize 10 of our performing arts collections. So just a lot of new exciting things happening. I'm really proud of our staff um, and wanna give them uh, tons of appreciation and, and thanks. Lee. Hi everyone, I'm Lee Pepper. I am the manager of museum experience. Um, I've been with the society for uh, almost three years now, came in in May, 2019. And so I focus on our public programming and all of our um, kind of public facing, visitor facing elements of the museum, whether it's, uh, you know, ticketing and, and uh, bringing on new volunteers, um, our public programming all the way down to facilities and operations. Um, this year has been really interesting in terms of uh, what we've been able to do. Uh, first off, one of the most exciting things was that we were able to open up the museum once again in June, and we've had it open um, six days a week, barring you know when we don't have uh, uh, adequate volunteer coverage, uh, but we've welcomed in a whole bunch of people who uh, either are coming back to the museum or this is their first time visiting, um, especially if, uh, especially folks who came uh, really interested in, in seeing the rainbow flag that we had acquisited, that we had um, brought in and, and created that exhibit. 
We also have continued our public programming uh, in the virtual space. We did 28 public programs in 2021 and brought in 55 speakers and collaborated with a couple of other organizations. Just last week, we, we did an, an event where we collaborated and co-sponsored with the Jewish Family and Children's Services Holocaust Center in, in San Francisco. So we were really excited about that. Um, We've also brought on a whole bunch of new volunteers. One, you know, side effect of being closed for a, a year, year and a half due to a pandemic is that, you know, we've, uh, we've done a lot more volunteer push to get some, some new folks in. A lot of folks moved away um, or were no longer, you know, able to continue volunteering. And we've really had a bunch of wonderful new folks kind of in integrating with our wonderful established volunteer team. And for those of you who are uh, watching right now, who are part of our volunteer team, I am endlessly thankful for you all the time, every day. Um, and I will say a couple of really exciting things that we have coming up are, uh, we've been working with an organization called Cloud Guide to develop our very first audio tour in the museum. So we are finalizing the script for that and they'll be uh, uh, hiring voice actors soon and we will be announcing it. You know, hopefully we'll have it ready uh, early 2022 to be able to allow uh, visitors who come into the museum to have a guided audio experience in lieu of us, you know, being able to have things like field trips and group tours as we've been trying to figure out what being in the physical space of the museum looks like right now with COVID concerns. Um, that being said, if you are, you know, interested in volunteering too. Um, we're always looking for more folks and we're gonna be doing a big volunteer push in January. If you're interested in joining the volunteer team, you can go to glbthistory.org slash volunteer. And I will uh, turn it over. I think we've got Polly next for talking about some other cool updates. Hey, and this is Tally, and I want to make certain. Did you you said Tally? I'm up, correct? It's all you, Tally. Okay. I was like, there may be a Holly. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure. Is it Holly or Tally? So anyway, hey, I'm Tally Bray. Really excited to be here. Uh, I am also a board member, and I think I've been on the board probably for about two and a half years. Um, and like many of you, uh, this is an organization that is both uh, personally. Um, very important to me and my family, and also from a community um, perspective, clearly something that uh, I know we all are deeply committed to. Um, not only our current success today and as we sort of move forward, but also much longer term. And I want to sort of trans transition to that into branding and to provide a very brief update on how we are thinking right now about rebranding. So um, tiny bit about the history, you know, our, our first name was San Francisco Bay Area Gay and Lesbian Historical Society. Um, and since then, we have rebranded twice. Um, one in the early 90s to gain Lesbian Historical Society of Northern California, and then again um, in 99 to what we have today, uh, GLBT Historical Society. And because you know terminology has shifted, how we recognize and engage community has shifted, what we're recognizing is that our name really no longer accurately captures who we are, the histories that we wanna tell with a really inclusive lens. Um, so what we've done so far as we're thinking um, through the rebranding and working through the rebranding process is we've convened a branding committee um, and that branding committee is working on a very well-researched proposal. We've worked with a branding agency to conduct a survey and focus groups with various constituents um, across the community to determine the need to rebrand. So number one, do we agree and does the community agree in the need to rebrand and then help establish some guiding principles which are very important for this kind of exercise. So where we are right now is we're currently reviewing multiple brand identities um, and what our intention and our goal is. Um, fundamentally, any name, uh, or brand that the Historical Society um, adopts must be rare, uh, an acronym, so representative, clearly very important that it represents our entire community, um, and it should not be specific to a particular subgroup. Uh, accessible, it should be recognizable, um, easy to pronounce, concise, um, understandable, um, you know, recognizable a name that does not need explaining, that doesn't need someone like me standing up explaining why the name is what it is, um, and that reflects 
the work that we do and where we're going. So who we are and who we aspire to be, and then expansive, right? A name that's gonna grow with us, allowing us to really fulfill our core archival mission, which we know is foundational, while creating room to expand as we continue to grow into a really world-class institution. Um, and then longevity, right? A name that's going to be a bit more resilient in terms of changing and evolving climate. Um, so, how can you get involved if you would like to get involved? Please visit glbthistory.org slash rebrand. So our website slash rebrand, um, and we will, uh, there will be a short survey um, that should be available and please visit. And if you would like to get engaged, reach out to us. Uh, and that is the rebranding update. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew and Ben to talk about the new museum process. Thank you, Tali. Um, before we get into the new museum process, I just want to highlight something um, that Kelsey and Lee were talking about earlier, that for the last year, we have done a huge amount of work to make our, res our resources available and accessible, uh, especially to people online, especially to people outside of the Bay Area, because we know it is not everybody lives here, but everybody needs to know their history. Um, and so a lot of the work that we've been doing behind the scenes over the last year has really been focused on making sure that anybody anywhere can access really high quality LGBTQ history. And we'll have more to say about this in the coming months, but one part of that is taking our resources, our materials, and physically taking them outside of the Bay Area, including some very exciting recent uh, archival acquisitions. So stay tuned for more information on that in the coming months and years, but um, we are very excited to be able to uh, work on traveling exhibitions that allow us to go beyond just the Bay Area and just the people who are in our backyard. Um, so Charlie, we'll, we'll continue our conversations there. Um, with that, uh, Ben, are you, I can't, a year and a half, the pandemic, I don't know how to use Zoom yet. Okay, there's Ben. <laughs> Very good. So we're here just to talk about the, uh, the new museum project. This is something that we've been working on really for the last five years um, to expand our physical facilities because we know that our current facility is just too small to tell the number of stories that we want to tell. Um, and so um, Ben, do you want to offer some quick some quick updates here? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, my name is Ben Gilliam. I joined the board in January of 2020 uh, and I currently I'm the treasurer and also chair of the finance committee and the real estate committee, uh, which is why I'm speaking on this. We, as Andrew indicated, we started these conversations with the city a few years ago, and it's taken this long for us to reach, which in June was a really wonderful announcement that the city had decided to dedicate $12 million uh, to uh, museum facility. Uh, since that time, uh, the city officials have started the long process of identifying and acquiring a site for us. We don't know what shape that's going to take yet, uh, but we are fully engaged with them and very excited about that. The archives is a crown jewel of what it is that we do, so we're excited that over the long term we can build a good foundation support system for both of them. At the same time, I want to take a minute to recognize our GLBT Historical Society Archives and Museum staff. Through the last year and a half of the pandemic, they have done an amazing job, not only in terms of taking care of the archives and the museum, but in terms of being resilient as we've gone through this time. And I think it, it speaks a lot to the quality of the people that we have right now on our staff. We are in 2022 going to focus on building our capacity to operate and support a larger institution. We recognize the responsibility that comes with the funding of $12 million. And so we're, we're laying out the architecture to create something that will be very successful and very sustainable in the long run. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And I think that's really important to highlight as well, that we are really committed to sustainable, scalable growth. You know, we we know this is a huge project, a huge undertaking, um, and we take that responsibility very seriously. I also realized that I forgot to introduce myself. That's my mistake. 
Hi, I'm Andrew. I'm the Director of Development and Communications. And along with Kelsey, I am also the Co-Interim Executive Director. I think I got our title right. Um, it's a, a big mouthful. Um, and with that said, it would be remiss of me not to encourage everyone on the call um, to contribute, to join us, um, not only as we work towards this larger museum, but also as we just keep so much history alive. We hold, hold over a thousand individual collections of irreplaceable LGBTQ history that we make available all throughout the year. Um, and if you'd like to help us and become part of our chosen family, um, you can go to glbthistory.org slash donate. Um, and I will send you a very nice thank you letter when you do. Um, up next, we have uh, Maria, who's going to join us once again to talk about the process of removing the interim uh, executive directors and going with something a little bit more permanent. Yes, um, we are. We, we have begun the task to uh, find a, a replacement for Terry. Um, as most of you know, we're looking for a highly skilled nonprofit leader who can help us continue to grow into a world-class institution. Um, we, um, we have begun some of the process, you know, and uh, at the moment we're finalizing the job description, interviewing search firms, um, and we're hoping, we're utilizing search firms so we can perhaps get a more deep dive into what is the ideal candidate to um, take the agency to the next step, the next phase. Um, uh, we should have that the search firm selected in, in, in a uh, week or two here um, and recognizing that we're sliding into the holiday period, we expect to start set, accepting applications or reviewing applications um, beginning uh, January, first week in January. So um, hopefully we can get it wrapped up by the end of the January, early February. And the job will also be posted on our website and we'll also distribute it through our various you know, social media channels and, and other, we'll distribute it far and wide. So um, I will turn it over to Francisco and, and Yves um, about board role recruitments. Board Hi, good evening. My name is uh, Yves Averus and I'm uh, one of the uh, newer, but not last uh, uh, recruit of the board. I'm, I'm from the, the pandemic uh, uh, series. We, uh, we never met, uh, we met only once in person. And uh, I will go through a little bit about what it means uh, to be a board member. Uh, and uh, among other things, we uh, support the mission and work of the GLBT Historical Society and uh, provide mission-based leadership uh, strategy governance and fiduciary oversight for the organization. And uh, this is a, a very important part of it. Um, and uh, I would like to highlight a little bit of uh, a few of those uh, um, uh, items, mission, vision and values. Uh, the mission being uh, to collect, preserve, exhibit and make accessible to the public materials and knowledge to support and promote understanding of LGBTQ history, culture, and arts in all their diversity. And I wanted to highlight that because it's really uh, the heart of an organization to have a, a mission, to identify with that mission, and to support and promote that mission. Um, our, the vision, uh, we have, you know, there's a lot of things in our manual that I'm referring to about our vision, and but I wanted to highlight uh, the fact that we envision a world in which LGBTQ people find acceptance, strength, and pride in acknowledging their heritage and in sharing it with society as a whole. Uh, and among our values, uh, which are, uh, you know, very important part in how we uh, organize our board and how we interact with one another. Uh, we support debate, dialogue, and uh, discussion about the LGBTQ past as a way to educate, inspire, and empower LGBTQ people and our allies in building our future. Uh, so the, the role of a board, as you, uh, some of you may know, uh, is, is also to uh, be here to give the guidance, you know, and, and there are lots of various responsibilities. Uh, one of them, as Maria uh, showed you, uh, 
by explaining our, our current uh, quest for a new executive director is to hire, supervise, and evaluate the executive director. Also, um, ensure that uh, the executive director has the support needed to further the mission and strategic plan for the uh, of the organization. So. Um, it's it's uh, the the function of oversight is not to be uh, discounted. You know, reviewing uh, our financial statement, also helping in making uh, the financial health of the organization uh, robust. Uh, so, a, a large part of our uh, our work as as board members is to um, you know fundraise and also uh, help uh, the association financially uh, whenever possible. And um, and to the point where we are today, it's also to recruit board members. Uh, and um, what does it entail? Um, we are uh, elected by the board to 24 months terms, and uh, we may be elected to no more than three consecutive terms. Uh, there are more details that I will, I will pass. And uh, we're also committed to, uh, a, you know, a minimum level of attendance. Uh, so we meet uh, monthly, at least for the, the board the general board meeting, uh, plus any uh, committee you may belong to, um, belong to the governance committee. And um, like um, you heard my colleague, uh, Ben, you can also belong to uh, many uh, board committee uh, as your time and, and and uh, our capabilities uh, allow you. Uh, so that's a, that's a little round of the, the technicalities and I'll, I'll hand it to uh, Francisco. We'll give you a little more uh, depth about what it means to be a board member of this organization, because we also have, um, as you saw from our mission, uh, high values that we want to promote in, in our hiring. So Francisco, up to you. Hello everyone, thank you for letting me be with you tonight. My name is Francisco Rosas, I'm also a board member. Um, as Eve was mentioning, we do have several active uh, subcommittees or working groups that the board is on. And one of those is the governance committee. Um, and I am kind of in charge of the governance committee whose uh, one of our major roles is to maintain you know an active board membership um which i'm happy to share more with you um we're looking for board members um but to be um to be candid we, you know we are looking to expand our board membership with an intention towards inclusivity intersectionality to be really representational and ambitious um, that the board members of this organization reflect the communities that we hope to serve, that we are serving, the ones that maybe we aren't serving currently, that we aspire to serve as well. Um, so in our kind of search for new board candidates, we are looking for, you know, people with a, a range of skill sets and kind of backgrounds, um, professional backgrounds, community organizing backgrounds, but also um, our intentions are really to, as I said, expand the board with an eye towards inclusivity and diversity. Um, uh, kind of commitment is in that process. And if you are interested in sharing more with us about board, board encourage you to reach out to the board at board at glbthistory.org. That is the best way to be in touch with us. So, thank you. And I will turn it over to the next part of the agenda, which is back to Andrew and Maria. Thanks, Francisco. Um, and thank you, Eve. Um, we have, I think now we are evenly split. We have 10 board members and 10 staff members. Um, we've got 10 of each. Um, and so we're excited to continue growing um, on both ends in the coming uh, months and years. We're going to go into now some question and answer time, um, sort of general discussion. We're actually a little bit of ahead of schedule, which never happens. Um, so very, very glad for that. Um, I want to encourage folks, if you have questions, to use the chat function and type out your question there. Um, so please uh, start that process and submit a few things there. 
Um, I also did want to note that we have a couple of other staff members on the call who haven't um, had a chance to participate. So if you'd like to introduce yourselves in the chat, um, you're more than welcome to. And Lee, did you want to talk a little bit about our upcoming programming real quick while we're waiting for questions to come in? Maybe not. Well, if you want to know about upcoming program, I'll I'll just tell you. Uh, Andrew, I have I can I can do that if you if okay. You. Uh, so we're going to be doing a program. Um, this Friday is actually a program um, with uh, former board member Landa Lakes, as well as um, some other members of the Two Spirit community who are going to be talking, having discussion about Two Spirit identity. Um, we're really looking forward to that. Um, and then in December, we have um, one program, which is an author talk by, um, and Lee will have to fill in the, the name of the author for me, I can't remember, but it is somebody who published a book recently on the 25 year struggle for same sex um, marriage equality in the United States, uh, culminating with the Obergefell decision in 2015. I'm a historian, I should remember this. Um, 2015, if I'm not mistaken. And then in um, January, we're also going to have one program. We will be continuing with our popular program series, which includes curiosities, show and tell with objects from various collections in the archives that we do with our um, uh, museum registrar, Ramon Silvestre, who specializes on conservation of the ar uh, objects in the archives, as well as our popular uh, Mighty Reels film series, which um, screens historic footage in, again, different archival collections. We've done one on um, Pride in the 1970s. Um, we plan to be doing one, we hope, on some queer blue light footage, which we've recently made available, again, through the online collections portal on our website. That's coming up probably in March. Lee and I are actually working on that program description now. So that's sort of what's, that's the preview of coming attractions. Um, Lee, if you wanna add anything? Lee is actually having Zoom problems. <laughs> their, their Zoom crashed, which uh, happens from time to time. It does happen from time to time. It's very annoying. You'd think after a year and a half in the pandemic, they would get their act together. And but... those of you on the call, Kelsey just um, put a link to our online collections into the chat. Um, so that's where, that's the one shop shopping for both um, our digital collections, as well as our topical primary source sets that, that the archive staff have worked very hard on getting up in the last 16 months. All right. We've got some good questions coming in. Um, Charlie, I see your question there. What new exhibitions are coming up? Um, oh, and we have an answer from Nalini, how perfect. Um, I, I won't read the whole thing, but as Delaney mentioned, the, the next thing that we're going to be posting online is we're going to actually digitize our main gallery at the museum, which is something that we've never done before. Um, so if you've been to the back gallery at the new museum, it sort of walks through um, a century of like Bay Area LGBTQ life. Um, so it's a really good sort of primer for LGBTQ history. Um, so it'll be a great thing to have online and available. Um, so it'll be a nice thing. It's a, a huge amount of work to digitize something of that scale, um, but it'll be a really nice thing to be able to, to launch. Um, hey, Lee's back. That's exciting. I guess thank you for, <laughs> for taking over, Mark. Uh, right at the time that I was gonna hop in, I suddenly could not use any of my Zoom buttons. Um, thank you for letting everybody know about, especially I realized um, as I was talking last, I forgot to mention that we had launched those series, which has been really neat. And um, I've been really proud that we have launched into this original programming and it's given, given people an opportunity to really um, take a look at what we have in our collections. Uh, you know, I've been thinking of the Curiosity Corner is like a, like a queer show, at, queer archives show and tell, which has been really fun. Um, we don't have the, you know, the, the finalized uh, descriptions and everything out, but uh, we are also in January going to be having a talk 
with Alison Brantley, who's an author uh, who has written a book called Brewing a Boycott, which is all about the uh, Coors boycott. And she's going to be talking with um, Miriam Frank, who is a scholar who uh, has been working on, uh, she worked on a, on a book called Out in the Union about labor and LGBTQ uh, activist alliances uh, for the last like 30 years. So I'm really excited for those coming. I can respond to the question around um, our connection with the queer history conference that I saw. Um, so we are we are official co-hosts of that conference. Um, so that is, uh, I'm glad that that was raised. It's a very exciting conference. Um, it's a queer history conference that's going to happen in June. Um, registration will hopefully be open in January-ish. Um, so we'll do publicity around that, make sure it will be coming out in our newsletter and our um, social media, et cetera. Um, but it is a really great, at the, uh, Mark noted, it's you know, an amazing opportunity to support and promote LGBTQ history and lots of folks will be in town. Uh, we will be hosting an archivist uh, sort of brown bag lunch session to provide an opportunity for sort of archivists attending the conference to, to meet up, but also folks sort of interested in queer archives um, to come and, and chat with us and other archivists. Um, we're also going to be hosting a tour of the archives, um, which will be limited to 20 people, so sign up quick. Um, <laughs> and then we'll be uh, hosting the opening reception, um, details of that sort of to follow. We're working on some logistics around that. So we'll be deeply embedded in the conference um, and hope that folks can attend. Yeah, thank you for, thank you for um, filling this all in, Kelsey. It'll be an exciting conference. Um, and I'm cautiously optimistic that it'll be okay to be in person and having groups of people from all over together again. Uh, it's been so long <laughs> and as much as we love we'll be, we'll be following all, you know, local and state guidelines and, and staying abreast of that, obviously safety coming first. Um, but the plan is for it to be an onsite event. Very, very excited for that. It'll be a fun one. And I think also a very affordable conference, which is um, not always the case and always nice when that happens. Um, I see another question here about internship opportunities. Um, the question is, is there any internship opportunity for exchange students? I am an exchange student majoring in gender studies at SFSU, go SF State, um, and interested in working for LGBTQ organizations. Um, Kelsey, do you have any, um, we don't, I don't think we currently have any archival internships open, do we? So yeah, so in the, the quick answer is yes, we have internships and volunteer positions um, available at both the museum and in the archives. Um, archival, our archival internship program is designed for graduate students in library science um, or archives or a related field. Uh, so you can sort of reach out to me directly. We have um, information online about our internships. We, We've been sort of, we started welcoming back on site interns throughout the pandemic. We've been doing remote internships. Um, so we're still sort of doing a hybrid model there. Um, but yeah, those are uh, really about training and archival skills um, and learning more about your history. Uh, Lee or Nalini, do you want to speak a little bit to some of the activities that, that are available for the museum? Uh, yeah, I, I can talk about it. And then Nalini, you hop in as well. Um, so on the museum side, um, this year was the first year that we offered, uh, we offered two internships over the summer. Uh, we kind of split them into a museum experience internship, uh, which uh, we had somebody who worked with me primarily on developing resources for um, docents and, and future tours, as well as some other guides, uh, and uh, as well as, you know, volunteer help, et cetera, that, that kind of educational um, uh you know, historical communication side of things. Um, and then Nalini can talk a little bit more about um, the exhibits side internship. Um, we decided that we would not be doing a fall internship just because uh, of everything going on and need to catch up on some things, but it's our hope that we'll be um, opening internships uh, for a little bit uh, early, you know, early, early 2022 or the, or the spring semester as well. Um, and we do accept uh, remote internships. So uh, Nalini can speak a little bit more on kind of what our, what our plans for that are. I don't know if Nalini is going to be able to hop in, um, but I will just reiterate to check out the web page that Mark posted in the chat. 
uh, has all of our upcoming job and internships posted there. Um, and we do update it every time we have a new uh, job posting or a new internship opening. Um, so that's the best place to check out. Um, also make sure to subscribe to our newsletter because when we do have openings, that's a good place to, um, to hear about them. So you don't have to go and uh, check that webpage every month. Um, and I think that's, uh, Mark, if you wanna put the link in the chat for that, I think it's just glbthistory.org slash newsletter. Um, we tend to be very literal with our links and emails. So um, now, I'll note in the archives, our internships are generally um, sort of quarterly um, or, or around a student schedule. So they're sort of on a rolling basis um, and in line with sort of staff capacity to manage. So if you're interested in an internship, I say that just to, just to reach out to me, that's usually the best uh, place to start. I see one other, um, uh, more of a suggestion than a, a question, but the uh, suggestion to do a 40 objects for our 40th history anniversary, uh, which is a lovely idea. I think that would be a really fun um, exhibition. We're, we were founded in 1985. Um, so it will be our 40th anniversary, believe it or not, in only four years. Um, I know we don't look a day over 29, um, but we will indeed be 40 very soon. Um, that suggestion was from Paula. Paula, thank you. Um, I'm, I copied your text down and am going to forward it to Nalini forthwith for because it's a really lovely um, exhibition suggestion. My idea would be to have one room in the new museum for each object. You know, that's, that's what we're all aspiring to. I like your optimism, Mark. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. We can give it uh, just a minute. Um, but I did want to, again, just thank all of our amazing board members and uh, members of our staff who really do work hard all year round to, uh, to make all of our resources available. Um, the impetus for hosting this town hall um, was basically because over the last two years, we've done a lot of growing and working and developing, um, and we haven't really had many opportunities to show or to meet people. Um, most of our members and donors haven't even had a chance to meet our board members um, or many of our staff members who've joined either just before the pandemic or during the pandemic. So we really wanted just to let everyone know who we are, what we've been up to, um, and give folks a chance to, to ask questions, uh, talk to us, and see our beautiful faces, know that we're not just email addresses, but we are indeed real people after all. And I'll say thank you to Andrew's team, which is the development and communications team of Michaela, Andrew and Mark. Um, they all do a really wonderful job of reaching out to uh, donors and community members, um, managing the membership program, um, also managing our grants and, and fundraising activities there along with Daniel, our finance director. So I will. I will say a thank you to all of them as well as the program staff. I really appreciate all the support that they provide. And I would say on behalf of the board, we, we greatly do appreciate all the staff efforts that you've been doing, especially over this difficult past year and a half. It has been a very interesting year for all of us, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, all right, now I have a question. Charlie, what is Polar Pride Day? Is that pride in being polar or pride at the pole? Art, the, the Arctic in Antarctica. Really? There's a, a boat leaving England, the, the, the Sir Richard Attenborough, and they're going to fly a rainbow flag down in Antarctica outside the Falkland Islands. Hmm. Well, that is very interesting. I, that's, that's quite a reach. Mm -hmm. they, they've had both the rainbow flag and the trans flag in uh, Antarctica, by the way. That's amazing. For, for anyone who doesn't know, Charlie Beale is a, one of our favorite collaborators at the Gilbert Baker Foundation um, and who worked with us quite a lot over the last couple of years to, uh, to find and acquire and bring back the original rainbow flag uh, back home to San Francisco where I may be biased, but I believe it belongs. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to see it, definitely get your tickets to come to the museum and check it out. Someone noted that they were um, thanking us for having the town hall and keeping updated on the activities. So I'll use this as another shameless moment to, to talk about how um, something cool the archive staff have done um, that I didn't mention at the top. Uh, our reference staff 
um, including Isaac Fellman, who's our reference archivist, uh, has worked very hard to, this is potentially really nerdy, but update our catalog, <laughs> including hundreds of hundreds of new records of collections um, with detailed finding aids. So things are much more searchable, much more findable for researchers. Um, and it's just really transformed people's ability to find the material and access it quickly um, and sort of prepare for their research visits. So I just wanted to give um, sort of a shout out to, to Isaac on that. He's, he's worked really hard. Ben. Uh, Kelsey, I just want to tell you, um, what you said is so meaningful because when I decided to join the board, what swayed me was reading all the obituaries from all the AIDS, all the AIDS survivors um, that didn't make it past 95 to 2000, but their lives were so meaningful to where we are today. So um, I wanna tell you that the work you're doing right now is like so important because it inspired me to be where I am right now. So thank you. Absolutely. I think that is, um, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kelsey. I just said thank you, it's very kind. Thank you, Ben, and all of our, our board members. I just put a link in the chat as well for um, another mildly shameless plug, but Kelsey's team has done a really fantastic job over the last year of moving stuff online. And we have one web page where you can sort of branch out to most of our online resources, um, our digital collections, our online exhibitions that Nalini and Lee and their team have been working on um, over the last year, um, as well as primary source sets, which are also a really amazing um, thing that I don't think we've talked about, but it's just a, a taste, a little bit just to get you started on a whole range of topics. Um, and they're really great tool for students, for researchers, as well as just people who want to learn more about our history. Um, not seeing any more questions in the chat. Um, I am always a fan of meetings that end early because it very rarely happens, um, but it's always a nice little treat when it does. Um, so unless there are any other questions, I would like to uh, propose that Maria, do you want to take us out? Sure. Um, again, thank you everyone for attending. and. Um, please feel free to uh, reach out to uh, us if you do have any other questions that come up. Um, we'll keep you posted on the various initiatives that we talked about and um, look forward to seeing all of you in person someday. <laughs> so thank you again for your time and your interest. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, board members. Thank you, staff. Thank you, all of our members and donors and volunteers. Thank you all. Round of applause. We're a very thankful group. I like that. Like that. Happy holidays too. Yeah. Yes. Happy holidays. It is very seasonally appropriate to be thankful. So that's good.